Greetings, this is your host, Paul Lawrence. I produced this Fatima film back in 1947 and 48. We had it completed in 48. I had first heard the story of Fatima when I was on Saipan during World War II. Somebody sent me Father Casella's little pamphlet on Fatima. He was the first priest in America to distribute this story and he also put out a monthly magazine keeping people informed of what was going on. Uh, since I was official photographer I figured at the end of the war I'd better make a movie on Fatima. So when the Pilgrim Virgin statue came through on in 1948 it was, uh, I had had the film completed and the uh, Stephen Oraz was with the statue as well as Monsignor McGrath and uh, one of the other priests and so we showed him the film down at Dominican where they were staying that night in Marin County and uh, he said and bo both the priest and he both said that, that there could be more to the story and it could be much improved if we would work it over so Stephen came out to our home and worked up a whole new script for it and then I had to shot, shoot a lot more footage but we finally got it put together and uh, Stephen would lecture along outside the church if the church was too crowded while a statue was touring. Then he left the statue and started touring himself throughout the nation. He also brought the film and gave his lectures in various music halls and schools and auditoriums and any place that could be found, even in the open fields, they would show the film sometime and he would give his lecture. So now we will show you the film. The country of Portugal, located in Western Europe, is situated on the Iberian Peninsula. It is small in area, about the size of the state of Florida, with half a million inhabitants. Portugal became a nation about eight centuries ago, but its people date before the Christian era. The Portuguese nation as a whole are descendants of many ancient peoples, including the Lusitanians, the Celts, the Phoenicians, Greeks, Carthaginians, Romans, Visigoths, Berbers, and the Moors. It is from this last people, the Moors, that the name of Fatima came to Portugal, 
for the town of Fatima was named after a Moorish princess. As we look at the country around Fatima, we find a people who are happy, but poor and unprogressive. A peasant family is seen thrashing wheat. This work is done in the same primitive way as has been done for centuries. After the thrashing, the grain is taken to one of the windmills which dot the countryside, where it is ground into flour. Although Fatima itself was a peaceful village, yet the nation of Portugal as a whole was not at rest, for it was ruled by a minority group of godless, anti-clerical political leaders. And the world at large was in distress, for the First World War was in progress, and hope for peace was uppermost in all minds. Every Portuguese village has its little Catholic church. Here at Fatima is the one attended by the three little children around whom this narrative is woven. Theirs is an interesting story and one of vital importance for the peace of the world hinges on the fulfillment of its message. Little Jacinta is six years of age. Her brother Francisco is eight and their cousin Lucy, nine. In poverty-stricken countries, it is often the custom for small children to carry the responsibilities of adults. Thus it was that Lucy and her two cousins had the duty each day of looking after the family flock of sheep, taking them to pasture. The children would sit on the hillside to play their games, keeping an eye on the flock close by. These pasture lands were far from home, so the children brought their lunch usually consisting of bread, fruit, and cheese. After lunch, they were accustomed to say the rosary. However, they liked playing as well as praying. So to have more time for their play, Jacinta devised a streamlined way of reciting the rosary. Our Father, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail Mary. Hail Mary, Hail Mary. Suddenly, the children's prayer was interrupted by the apparition of an angel from heaven who stood before them in the form of a young man. The children were too amazed to speak, but the angelic visitor drew near and said, Fear not, I am the angel of peace. Pray with me. The children repeated the prayer they heard him pronounce. My God, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love you. I ask pardon for those who do not believe, nor adore, nor hope, nor love you. Then the angel said, Pray thus. The hearts of Jesus and Mary are attentive to the voice of your supplication. The angel then disappeared, leaving the children bewildered at this strange visit. As one of their playmates was approaching, they agreed among themselves to reveal this to no one. Twice again that same year, this heavenly visitor was to appear to them. In the second visit, he told them, I am the guardian angel of Portugal. Pray a great deal. Offer prayers and sacrifices continually to the Most High God. Offer them in reparation for the sins that offend God and for the conversion of sinners. In this way, draw down peace upon your country. Accept and bear with submission all the sufferings that the Lord will send you. During the angel's final visit, which came in the fall of that year, he appeared holding a host above a golden chalice. Prostrating himself on the ground, he bade them to say with him this prayer, Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I adore you profoundly and I offer you the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, present in all the tabernacles of the earth in reparation for the outrages 
sacrileges, and indifference with which he himself is offended. And through the infinite merits of his most sacred heart and of the immaculate heart of Mary, I beg of you the conversion of poor sinners. The children joined in these prayers, after which the angel gave the host to Lucy and the contents of the chalice to Francisco and Jacinta, saying as he did, Take and drink the body and blood of Jesus Christ, horribly insulted by the ingratitude of men. Make reparation for their crimes and console your God. On Sunday, May 13, 1917, as was the usual custom, the children were tending their sheep. They had taken them to a pasture land belonging to Lucy's father, called the Cova de Iria. They were playing in the field of the Cova when they were startled by a flash of light which seemed to come from the east. Suddenly, they beheld, standing above a small home oak tree, the most beautiful lady they had ever seen. At first they were frightened, but she spoke to them gently. Do not be frightened. I will not harm you. Finally, Lucy summoned enough courage to ask, Where are you from? And why have you come? I come from heaven. I ask you to come here for six months in succession on the 13th of each month at the same hour. In October, I will tell you who I am and what I want. You will all go to heaven, but Francisco must first say many rosaries. I want you to offer yourself to God and bear all the sufferings which he will send you in reparation for the countless sins by which he is offended and for the conversion of sinners. You will have much to suffer, but the grace of God will be your comfort. Say the rosary devoutly every day to obtain peace for the world. Once Our Lady was gone, the children turned towards home and decided among themselves to keep the visit of Our Lady a secret. That evening at home, Jacinta was so excited about what they had seen that she could not refrain from speaking about the beautiful lady. Her parents were reluctant to believe, even though Francisco verified her story. It was not long until the news had spread throughout the whole village, news that was to cause the children much suffering. For not only were they not believed, but were ridiculed by their friends and accused of fraud and deception. As time went on, the children continued to live a normal life. They often played in Lucy's backyard near the well where the angel had appeared to them the year before. Here they frequently discussed among themselves the visions of the beautiful lady. They talked about her visit to them in June when she told them to say this prayer with each decade of the rosary. O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, and lead all souls to heaven, especially those who have most need of thy mercy. She had also revealed that Francisco and Jacinta would soon be taken to heaven, but that Lucy would have to remain on earth. However, since she was unable to read or write, she must learn to do so. As the children's playmates met them from time to time, the topic of conversation invariably came round to the beautiful lady. Yet their story was still not believed by their parents or their parish priest. So they decided to ask Our Lady for a sign that all might believe. During her appearance in July, the Blessed Virgin Mary agreed to grant this request. She told them that on October the 13th, there would be a great miracle. The people should gather their friends together at the Kova, and on that day, she would show them a sign from heaven so that all might believe her message and know who she was. As Our Lady spoke these words, she stretched forth her hands, and from them rays of light seemed to penetrate the earth and open before them a vision of hell as a great sea of fire. In this burning sea could be seen the demons 
in the form of hideous animals and the condemned souls in human form. These lost souls were being tossed about by the flames like sparks of fire without weight or balance and were uttering horrible screams of pain and despair. The children were so terrified by this sight that they felt they would have died of fright had they not already been assured they would go to heaven. Finally, Our Lady addressed them. You have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish throughout the world the devotion to my Immaculate Heart. If people will do what I tell you, many souls will be saved and there will be peace. The war will soon end, but if people do not cease offending God, a still more terrible one will begin in the reign of Pius XI. When you see a night illuminated by an unknown light, know that it is the sign that God gives you that he is going to punish the world for the many crimes by means of war, of hunger, and of persecution of the church and of the Holy Father. To prevent this, I come to ask the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on the first Saturday. If my requests are heeded, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, she will spread her errors throughout the world, provoking wars and persecution against the church. Many good people will be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer. Various nations will be annihilated. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, and it will be converted, and a period of peace will be granted to the world. The news of the apparitions spread throughout Portugal like wildfire. The government was becoming alarmed, for great crowds from all over the land were converging on Fatima. The atheistic mayor of Orem, under whose jurisdiction the village of Fatima belonged, decided to put an end to all this nonsense. He would make it impossible for the children to be present at the Kova on the 13th of August. He would arrest them, force them to retract their false claims, expose this whole farce. Consequently, on the day appointed for the apparition, he had the children arrested and brought to his home. After questioning them, he tried to make them deny their statements and to reveal the secret Our Lady had given them. But in spite of his attempted bribes and threats, the children refused to change their story or to disclose the secret entrusted to them. The enraged mayor then ordered the children to be thrown into prison. But fearing violence, he released them on the morning of the second day. A few days later, Our Lady again appeared to the children not at the Kova, but at a nearby place called Valinos. She expressed her great displeasure at the action of the mayor and declared that as penalty, the miracle promised for October would not be as great as she had planned. On October 12th, all roads led to Fatima. Countless numbers of pilgrims made their way towards this hallowed spot of Our Lady's recent visits. They came from near and far, some from hundreds of miles away. Many came on foot, others on burrows or in ox carts or in whatever form of transportation could be found. As they trudged along, they usually could be heard reciting the rosary or singing hymns. Despite the cool, damp season, these devout people were willing to spend the night in the open fields to make sure of having a good place the next day. On the morning of the 13th, although a light rain fell persistently during the night and through much of the morning, some 70,000 persons had gathered in the Kova. The great multitude, tramping on the soft, wet earth, had turned the surrounding area into a vast puddle. There were few who were not soaked and chilled to the bone, but no one thought of going away. The rain had drenched their bodies, but it had not dampened their spirit. As the middle of the day arrived, 
the hour when Our Lady had promised to appear, some of the crowd grew restless. Yet the children were confident the beautiful lady would not disappoint them. At noon precisely, Lucy and her two companions began to recite the rosary, when very shortly, the familiar flash of light appeared, and once more, the children were beholding and listening to the Mother of God. In answer to Lucy's request, the heavenly visitor finally revealed who she was. I am the Lady of the Rosary. I want a chapel to be built here in my honor. I have come to warn the faithful to amend their lives and to ask pardon for their sins. They must not continue to offend our Lord, already so deeply offended. They must say the rosary every day. As Our Lady was about to leave, the overcast clouds parted and the sun shone through, but not in its usual brilliance. It was pale as the moon, like a silver disk, at which all could gaze without shielding their eyes. Then, to the astonishment of all, rays of many colors shot out from the sun in every direction, and it began to whirl in the sky like a gigantic wheel of fire, lighting up the whole countryside and the upturned faces of 70,000 people. Finally, to the horror of all, the sun seemed to be torn from its place in the heavens and to plunge downward as if it were about to fall on those terrified spectators in the Koba. Many, thinking the end of the world had come, fell to their knees and implored God's mercy. While this miraculous phenomenon was going on, the three children beheld in the heavens another wondrous manifestation, a vision which consisted of three successive tableaus, which symbolized one after the other the joyful, the sorrowful, and the glorious mysteries of the rosary. The first was a vision of the Holy Family. In the second, she appeared as Our Lady of Sorrows, accompanied by Our Lord, who was blessing the world. In the third vision, she appeared as Our Lady of Mount Carmel, crowned as Queen of Heaven with her infant son on her knee. This triple representation of Our Lady, as is most commonly understood, was a further clarification of her message as the Lady of the Rosary. The sight of the Holy Family brings to mind the joyful mysteries. Our Lady of Sorrows recalls the sorrowful mysteries. And lastly, Our Lady of Mount Carmel brings to mind the glorious mysteries and reminds us that as Queen of Heaven, she desires to help all souls get to heaven, and that she will deliver from purgatory, especially those who, through consecration to her, faithfully seek her intercession. Such is the story of the apparitions of the Mother of God to three small children of Fatima in 1917. In the late fall of 1918, just a year after the apparitions, the great influenza plague swept over Europe. Both Francisco and Jacinta became victims of that dread disease. On April 7, 1919, Francisco had said all the rosaries Our Lady had requested of him. And on that day, she took him to heaven. Jacinta, having been weakened by the influenza, was stricken with pleurisy and died February 20th, 1920 in a hospital in Lisbon, having foretold both the time and place of her death. Lucy, the oldest of the three, was destined to live on many years. Our Lady still wished to use her as an instrument in further revealing and clarifying her message. In 1925, she entered the convent, becoming a member of the Congregation of the Sisters of St. Dorothy, Twenty-three years later, in 1948, she transferred to the order of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, becoming a Carmelite nun. No doubt the Blessed Mother's appearance as Our Lady of Mount Carmel was a foreshadowing of this, as well as a reminder of the promises she made to those who faithfully wear her scapular. In 1927, ten years after the apparitions at Fatima, Our Lady again appeared to Lucy as she was praying in the convent in Spain, 
and gave her permission to reveal the first two parts of the secret entrusted to the children at the Kova. The first, concerning the vision of hell, and second, the spread of communism, the conversion of Russia, prophecy of World War II, and the consequent great need of devotion to her immaculate heart. Upon the advice of her confessor, the third part of this secret was written down by Lucy and placed in a sealed envelope and given to her bishop with the understanding that it would be opened by 1960 or at her death, whichever came first. As one travels to Fatima today, one of the points of interest is the small house in which Lucy lived as a child. In back of her house stands the barn that was used mainly to shelter sheep. On its rough wall can still be seen two crosses placed there by Lucy to remind her to pray for her two cousins, Francisco and Jacinta. The parents of Francisco and Jacinta, Mr. and Mrs. Marto, both of whom died within the past few years, are seen standing by their house. It is a very humble dwelling, which shows the modest poverty in which these renowned parents lived to the end of their life. Seen with the Martos are two of their grandchildren, named Francisco and Jacinta, and Father Arthur Kimball, an American priest then living in Fatima. Not far from the Marto home stands the parish church of St. Anthony, where the three children, together with their families, were regular attendants. The graveyard alongside the church at one time contained the graves of Francisco and Jacinta. Later, however, their remains were moved to the great basilica where they are now buried. The Basilica of Fatima, with its vast gatherings on great festive days, is truly a magnificent sight to behold. The interior of this impressive edifice is a shrine which attracts countless souls desirous of fulfilling Our Lady's request of prayer and penance. The main altar is of modest proportions and bordered on each side with a statue of Our Lord and His Blessed Mother. In the two transepts on each side of the church are buried the bodies of Francisco and Jacinta. Once again are seen the festive crowds that gather on the 13th of each month from May to October to celebrate the anniversaries of the apparitions. So warm and personal is the devotion of these people to Our Lady, and so truly do they sense her presence that thousands of white handkerchiefs are waved as her image is carried by. This gesture of devotion, though now an established custom, is perfectly spontaneous and genuine. This small structure is the Chapel of the Apparitions and is located over the spot where once stood the small home oak tree over which the Mother of God appeared to the children. It was here that she gave them her message for the world. It was around this spot that the vast multitude of 70,000 witnessed the miracle of the sun. The late Bishop of Liria under whose jurisdiction is the village of Fatima, is here seen blessing statues for the people at the chapel of the apparitions. These pilgrims carry home from this hallowed shrine not only articles of devotion, they carry away in their hearts the message of Our Lady, determined to live it and to bring it to others. They remember her pledge that if not enough people fulfill her request, Russia's errors will spread throughout the world, promoting war and persecution of the church. The good will be martyred. The Holy Father will suffer much. And many nations will be destroyed. The statue of Our Lady is being carried in procession on a gold carriage. It is customary on the 13th of May and October to deck the carriage with pure white flowers. After the procession makes its way up the steps of the basilica, the statue will be placed beside the temporary altar erected in front of the main entrance. A special mass for the sick takes place at 12 o'clock noon. At times, the excessive heat at midday gives the sick and others present 
an added opportunity for a little penance. When the Mass is over, our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament is brought down to the sick who receive his blessing. Comparatively speaking, only a very few of the countless sick brought to this shrine obtain physical cures. Yet practically all of them go away spiritually strengthened, realizing that they carry but a splinter of the cross of Christ. They are enabled to carry it more willingly and more fruitfully. Once again, the great crowds are seen waving their handkerchiefs to Our Lady. To these people of great faith, her presence is very real. And as the ceremony comes to a close, they wave farewell as her image is carried by. No doubt they are mindful of her many requests and promises. She promised personal salvation to all who would fulfill her requests and world peace if enough persons would heed her message. She made it clear in her third apparition that only through her intercession would peace come to the world. If my requests are not heard, Our Lady foretold, Russia will spread her errors throughout the entire world, fomenting wars and persecution of the church. Many nations will be destroyed. Let us briefly see how tragically this prophecy is coming to pass. 1917, communists seize control of Russia. 1936, communists provoke civil war in Spain. 1938, World War II commenced, during which many nations fell under the yoke of atheistic communism. Included in these are Poland, East Germany, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Albania, Bulgaria, Romania, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia. 1949, communists gain control in China. 1950, communist China wages war in and takes over North Korea. 1954, communists overrun North Vietnam. 1959, Communists invade and take over Tibet, and the communist leader of millions visits America as an honored guest. 1960, thousands of communist-inspired students hold bloody riots in Tokyo, and communists break up Paris summit peace talks. The year also for the opening of the final message to Lucy of Fatima. Many, many books, pamphlets, and news stories have been published on Fatima. We may have at times become impatient, wanting to receive all of the information. In fact, Reverend Messias de Coelho, professor in the Diocesan Seminary of Fundao, Portugal, thinks this is a healthy attitude, for God created man with a natural curiosity. He says, woe to us if no one was interested in knowing what Lucy's letter contains. God knows very well why he acted in this way. It is perfectly just and normal that the secret should intrigue us. If Our Lady wished us not to think about it, if she wanted us to ignore its existence until it was revealed, she would have asked silence not only about the contents of the letter, but also about its existence. However, armed with Father Coelho's remarks, we must remember we have all the essential elements of the Fatima message, that of prayer, penance, the five first Saturdays, and consecration to the sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, our mother. We have seen of Our Lady's predictions and their tragic fulfillment. However, the greatest prediction of them all, the conversion of Russia and world peace, still awaits the fulfillment of certain conditions. God has entrusted to Our Lady of the Rosary the restoration of peace to the world. And she, in turn, has made it known that peace will be granted only when certain requests are fulfilled. Here again is a summary of these requests. First, penance and reparation. Sacrifice yourself for sinners, Our Lady requested. Many souls are going to hell. 
because there is no one to offer sacrifice for them. As our blessed Lord later explained to Lucy, the sacrifice required of every person is the fulfillment of his duties in life and the observance of my law. This is the penance that I now seek and require. Second, the daily rosary. Say the rosary always, was Our Lady's request. We should say it daily, and when possible, make it a family devotion. In addition, after each decade, we should add, O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, and lead all souls to heaven, especially those who have most need of thy mercy. Third, the five first Saturdays. Practice the devotion of the five first Saturdays, which means going to confession, receiving Holy Communion, reciting five decades of the rosary, and spend 15 minutes meditating on the mysteries of the rosary, all with the intention of making reparation. And fourth, the consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary is not a new devotion. It has existed in the church for centuries. However, Our Lady has given a new expression to this devotion, as well as a new impetus through her apparitions at Fatima. Thus, the heart of the Fatima message is this, to more surely save our own soul, to more fruitfully help save other souls, to repair for mankind's enormous rebellion against God, which prevents world peace. God wishes established throughout the world devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. As Our Lady assures us, I promise salvation to those who embrace it. By fulfilling these requests, we are following the things that Our Lady of the Rosary sought.
flags of eight nations enslaved behind the iron curtain of communism dipped in homage to our lady during the services at the national shrine of our sorrowful mother novena september tenth nineteen forty eight more than one hundred and twenty five thousand filed through the huge church to see the statue and hear the message of fatima while thousands more lined up for blocks waiting for hours outside Fatima Week at St. Meinrad's Abbey, August 14th to 19th, 1948, was probably the greatest highlight of the entire Pilgrim Virgin Tour. During the five days the famous statue remained there, more than 125,000 pilgrims from all parts of the United States came to take part in the many wonderful demonstrations and services honoring Our Lady of Fatima. The most remarkable part of all this is that there is not a town of 5,000 population within a distance of 18 miles of the Abbey. And most of these 125,000 people had no accommodations. Many slept in their cars, on the ground, or stayed up all night in prayer. Seldom in the history of the United States have there been such magnificent manifestations of love for the Mother of God than those that took place during Fatima Week at St. Meinrad. To add a little bit more to this tape, I would like to tell of a story when the Fatima statue came from Portugal and first toured America in 1948. There was a Monsignor McGrath who traveled with that statue at that time, and he visited us in our home and told us that when he was in the seminary in Canada, there was one of the young seminarians who was getting heavy amounts of mail from behind the Iron Curtain. Normally they would not look into the mail of a seminarian, but they decided since there was so much of it, they'd better check it. And so they found that it was instructions that he was getting once he became a priest. So they turned this information over to the Canadian government and he was deported behind the Iron Curtain. Now then, also there was a Boudens at that same time who was a member of the Communist Party and he left them and gave evidence to the United States government to the effect that every time there was a meeting, Communist meeting, they always asked before the end of it if there was anybody there that wanted to become a priest, a nun, a brother, or a minister. And he said hands always went up and they gave them false credentials from religious schools. So then, uh, when this happened in Canada, they did not let this priest be ordained. As I said, they sent him back behind the Iron Curtain. Now also around this same time, my brother-in-law was taking care of the dentistry of the Mother Superior of our convent here in San Anselmo. She told Tom at that time, she said, you know, I'm worried about the future of our convent. The young postulates, when they're there, they obey all the rules. And, uh, but as soon as they have taken their vows, they want to make changes. So you see, the nuns have kicked a habit. So could it be that these, some of them have become priests today, uh, could it possibly be that some of those are now bishops? There's certainly been enough time since 1948. Maybe this is why some of them are so disobedient to the Pope. Let us hope that peace will come. Christ promised in his lifetime that there would never be an end of his church. He would stay with it to the end of time. So we don't have to worry about Satan destroying our church, but we do have to worry about the many souls that he gains 
through the evils that are going through the world today.